Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, today's presentation, uh, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and international trade. Um, this is definitely a topic we get questions on. It's very, uh, very topical, as I'm sure you all know. Um, so we have an expert joining us today, which I'll get into, but you know, let us know this is obviously a very specific topic to your company, um, can be relatively confusing. Hopefully we'll clarify some things in today's presentation and, you know, keep in mind to always ask questions as we go. My name is Meredith Lambert. I will be your host today. Um, I am the marketing manager here at Traders Guarantee, which basically translates to being responsible for researching and creating educational content for you. Um, I am also the one that, you know, might will first see your questions. So send them on over. Joining me today is uh, Julie Demos. Julie has been in the insurance and risk management profession for 40 plus years. Um, she, it includes including experience in corporate risk management and insurance underwriting. Using a consultative approach, Julie assists clients in assessing their insurance and risk management needs and providing provides a solid action plan that will lead to an eff effectively oh my gosh, sorry, I can't talk, efficiently managed solution. Uh, Julie is an expert on today's topic, so we're really excited to have her join us. This webinar is being presented or hosted really by Trade Risk Guarantee, or as many of you know us as TRG. We are located in the heart of downtown Bozeman, Montana, and have been providing US customs bonds and cargo insurance solutions directly to importers since 1991. This direct to importer business model is unique to the international trade community since it cuts out the need for an additional middleman and allows TRG to become another member of your international trade team. Today's webinar is being presented with our partners at Total Insurance. Total Insurance is located in Northbrook, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, and has been doing business nationwide since 1971. Total's focus is on helping businesses with their risk management and with over 70 insurance professionals on staff, including CPAs, attorneys, and MBAs, they are able to find solutions that meet the needs of each individual company. We will be recording uh, today's webinar and it will be available on YouTube for future reference. If you want to be notified the moment it releases, I highly recommend you subscribe to our YouTube channel we also post additional educational videos on YouTube about once a month. Uh, so if you're not already, please uh, check out our YouTube channel. You can find us um, by searching trade risk guarantee hyphen TRG in YouTube. Now, as a quick reminder, this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. Please submit your questions in the question box in the webinar interface throughout the presentation. We will be answering as many as we can um, at the end of the presentation. Um, however, if any, if any questions come to mind during the presentation, please submit them via that question section um, in, that web, in the webinar interface. Uh, the questions submitted during the session will be reviewed and answered either by myself or our team of licensed customs brokers or by the experts at Total after today's webinar. So if we are not able to get to them during the presentation, we will reach out after the webinar. Okay, so let's get started. Um, in today's webinar, we will be covering the following topics. Uh, the recent, some recent statistics on cyber events, cyber management for importers and exporters, and cyber insurance for importers and exporters. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Julie now to kind of dive into these topics. Thank you, Meredith, and welcome, everybody. Okay. We'll start today with the State of the Union. Um, to begin the discussion on cybersecurity and international trade, it's worth taking a look at the overall State of the Union when it comes to what we term in the insurance industry as the severity and frequency of claims. What you will find is that the statistics are rather surprising based on what we hear every day in the news regarding cybercrime.
In the last five years, there's been a 72% increase in the cost of cybercrime. The majority of the costs are attributed to external sources causing the breach. This would be anyone outside the company that is attacking the data, also known as cyber hackers. However, when it comes to the numbers of frequency, which is 67% higher than five years ago, the majority are coming from accidental internal causes. These are categorized as human error and internal systems errors and not intentionally driven, such as in an external hacking. The external sources run at a close second, however, at 40% of the number of claims. This data suggests that the external sources of cyber crimes are costing the greatest and the internal errors are costing the least amount. A major component of this is the cost for ransom paid to hackers. There would not be a related cost to internal sources of the cyber incident as you're really not hacking your own data. Now, what are some of the, co the causes? And we're gonna do, um, there's several components of it. There are actually seven main causes. And one of them is business interruption. So what are the drivers that are causing the 72% increase in cost, okay? Any disruption of the business due to a cyber claim, whether malicious or accidental, can have a significant impact on a company's bottom line in this age of business heavily reliant on cyber technology. For hackers, they are cognizant of this, which continues to drive the external cyber attack on a business, typically via cyberjacking a company's data. These hackers freeze a company's data through encryption methods, decrypting only once the ransom is paid. So not only is there the loss of paying the ransom, which can be exorbitant, there is a loss of income from disrupting operations during this process. The supply chain has been disrupted. One of the examples is like you've seen in um, the last couple of years of how the shipping lines have been under cyber attacks um, and how that's disrupting the whole business chain in terms of not being able to get shipments in or out because of the data being frozen and their inability to let customers even schedule through them. Another is the remote working in COVID-19. COVID-19 has had and continues to have a significant impact of employees working remotely. While many companies have already gone in this direction, generally through a hybrid model, March of 2020 forced remote working on many companies who may not have been ready from a cybersecurity model for this to happen. Cybersecurity standards that are utilized in the workplace in some cases have had to be lowered so that employees can access data remotely. This combined with cloud usage, personal device usage, and lesser secured apps and platforms have contributed to the issue. And as companies evolve into new business models and practices to include online operations, to protect against future pandemic work stoppages, the risk of cyber crimes, cyber crimes will continue. The next is ransomware incidents. As mentioned a couple of slides back, ransomware incidents are a significant source of cybercrime cost. In 2019, the estimate of ransomware cost was $6.3 billion. And I'd like to uh, share with you a, a personal story for our own company at Total. Two years ago, uh, we experienced a uh, cyber attack which involved a ransom. And the way it happened was not directly to us, but through our uh, provider, our web service provider and our network provider. And the network provider who was located in California and is a major company and has lots of clients uh, was attacked and all of their data to include the data of all their clients was, encry was encrypted. So the only way that all of their customer data could be released was through a ransom, which they chose to pay. And it was an exorbitant amount in the six digit figures for the simple fact that they could not let their clients, including ourselves down, even with them paying that ransom, we were down for three days. Now, we did have backup systems that were like the old, uh, you know, paper systems, if you will, that allowed us to continue working. But the fact is, is, it wasn't an incident that was directly against our company, but we were affected by our network provider having been attacked. So, you know, keep in, 
when you think in terms of where these can happen, even in the best of circumstances for your own company, if you have a provider that gets attacked, it can affect you. And we'll talk later about um, cyber insurance and how we were able to go to our cyber policy and say, okay, we've got, we've got a problem. And they were there to help us. Another area is business compromised email attacks. When it comes to co businesses compromised in the email attacks, I can tell you from my personal experience that I work with three clients who have fallen victim to this in the last 12 months. The cybercrime perpetrators have gotten very sophisticated in phishing emails, watching patterns of email for formatting and the like, unbeknownst to the victim. By gathering this email intelligence, the cybercrime perpetrator is creating emails that are near flawless in replication. For example, these are being used to request invoices to be paid to seemingly verified vendors, et cetera, but they aren't. Another is the regulatory exposure. Globally, there are stricter data protection and privacy regulations being implemented, which means that companies will incur greater internal costs for meeting the requirements as well as the potential for higher penalties for not meeting the standards that results in a cyber incident. Another is mergers and acquisitions. In a merger or acquisition, part of the process is the due diligence analysis of potential liabilities for the acquired company. Some are more obvious than others, with cyber being one of the less obvious. And the way in which insurance policies are written, which we will discuss in a few slides going forward, the acquiring company may not have any recourse with the acquired company's insurance for payments on claims. Next, nation state sponsored attacks. Cyber attacks have been global use for political purposes and agendas. The attacks range from stealing intellectual property, sensitive national data, and disruption of business. The nation state involvement is providing the funding for the cyber criminals to execute the attack, really to cause economic harm. Next, we'll discuss the types of cyber claims that can affect the company for importers and exporters. To do that, I'm going to explain the difference between internal versus external types of claims. There are two components, as I said, the first and third party. The best way to think of this is that the first party is for those costs to the company and the third party are the potential liabilities to outsiders the company may have to pay as a result of a claim for damages being filed by the third party. For first party claims, the first party damages are a company's expenses from a cyber attack. They include the actual theft and or fraud component like the email phishing we discussed a few slides back, the cost to bring in a professional forensic investigation team to identify the scope of the attack, any loss of business during the attack, ransom, and loss of data, especially if the ransom isn't paid. For third party claims, the component refers to claims brought against the company, again, by a third party. A third party could be a customer and or a regulatory body as an example. The costs that fall into this category are providing notification to all affected companies and individuals, providing resources such as credit monitoring to the potentially affected parties, as well as fines if the breach is due to violating regulatory requirements, and claims from third parties that demonstrate the financial impact on them from the breach. So if what you did caused a breach or harm to a third party if they had a financial loss due to something that occurred through you that would be a third party claim such as as i have an example here transmitting malicious code and virus unbeknownst to yourself ocean shipping lines have become the increased target the ocean freight carriers are increasingly the target of cyber attacks due to the enormity and impact an attack has on the economic supply chain. There was CMA CGM in 2020, APM Maersk in 2017, Mediterranean Shipping in 2020, and Costco in 2018. Because of the trade impact, 
the shipping lines are willing to pay the ransoms the, the cyber criminals demand of them. And these criminals see it as an ongoing opportunity. Welcome to the world of cyber piracy. Part of the goal in freight supply chain risk management is to make sure goods arrive to their final destination in a timely manner. So while technology has had a favorable impact on this process by automating the logistical component and providing real-time data and shipments, technology has also created another threat at the same time to the supply chain. When a shipping company is under cyber attack, there is a shutdown on the ability to schedule shipments, which directly affects imports and exports. In Universal Cargo, September 29th, 2020's issue, it was reported regarding COVID-19. I'm going to read this directly what they reported. According to experts, we can expect the reevaluation and reprioritization of digital solutions to increase in the post-COVID era. This year has highlighted the importance of maintaining supplier relationships, assessing supply chain risk, and verifying data and contracts virtually. In addition, and here's the key point, data privacy and security issues are more important than ever before due to a higher risk of fraud and cybercrime. These increased costs to the shipping lines to mitigate the cyber piracy will affect everyone in the supply chain from the importers and exporters who are being charged higher rates to the end consumer who will need to pay more for the product. Now let's discuss cyber risk for importers and exporters and the practical application of risk management techniques against such incidents. The most important component to managing the cybercrime is to identify vulnerabilities, implement appropriate protections, and establish risk transfer methods should a cybercrime occur, even with the protections in place. For every step taken to prevent cybercrime, the criminals are taking the same to breach it. In identifying vulnerabilities, there are numerous companies that provide a cyber risk assessment that identifies all the potential areas for a breach, as well as potential financial impact of the breach. These consultants do what we call a, quote, deep dive into a company's operation. In addition to the full assessment, there are sources that provide a cyber scan, which is a non-intrusive evaluation of internet-facing systems and applications. These reports provide a score of risk, and the cyber scan can be a great first step to the full assessment. The next component of the risk management process is establishing risk transfer solutions. These risk transfer solutions are cyber risk insurance policies that provide coverage for both first and third party claims. Over the last five years, the cost for this insurance has seen a significant decrease due to primarily to the insurance industry becoming more comfortable with pricing the risk, as well as companies employing appropriate cyber protections for their companies. The benefit of the insurance policy is that they come with necessary resources for when an incident occurs to include pre-breach expert consultation, legal advice, forensic team, public relations support, breach, notification, credit monitoring, et cetera. Now, one thing that I will say about this is that these products actually provide this for you as part of your policy. So when you buy the cyber coverage, you get all these components with it. And that's why it's become very economical to buy cyber coverage because the insurance companies are getting hands-on involvement when claims occur so that they can mitigate the risk and um, keep it from getting um, basically out of control. One of the clients I spoke about earlier who had a breach last year didn't purchase a cyber liability policy. As a result, the company had to secure vendors who could provide all the resources that the insurance company automatically rolls into this product and pricing. I could tell you just for the forensic team alone, they ended up paying $30,000. And that is so far, so far more than they would have ever paid by probably like a hundredfold for the insurance. Another reason importers and exporters should give serious consideration to securing cyber insurance coverage is due to the marine insurance exclusion that may be included in the policies of shipping lines. The exclusion states that, and this is going to be long insurance verbiage, but bear with me on this one, 
In no case shall this insurance cover loss, damage, liability, or expense directly or indirectly caused by or contributed to by or arising from the use or operations as a means for inflicting harm, here's where the language is, of any computer, computer system, computer software program, malicious code, computer virus, or process, or any electronic system. Basically, they're excluding it. In the absence of securing your own coverage, uh, you would have to make sure that your marine partners don't have this exclusion in their policy. Now, one of the things I want to talk about here is that whole risk transfer component. And a lot of times when we engage in contracts with companies with anybody that's providing any kind of electronic services, data services, et cetera, they have what's called the indemnification language in the contract. That's a very important component in why it's been noted that buying cyber coverage is probably the most likely method for controlling risk because many of these contracts, the means of the indemnification product the indemnification wording, I should say, for the provider is that they are asserting that they'll just make it right. That doesn't mean that they're going to pay for damages. It doesn't mean it's going to pay for loss of your income. It's just that they'll correct whatever was wrong. And that's a limitation. And they do that on purpose because they, these companies can't afford to take on the liability for all their customers from a cyber event. Next, we'll talk about policy language. Okay, so let's say we've made the decision to buy a cyber insurance policy. So everything should be good, right? Well, I'd like to say you're good to go, but like anything, there are specifics to be aware of in the cyber policy that could affect the coverage. And let me go through the main ones here. First one is the definition of insured. And it's important that the policy uses an entity as well as employees in that definition. So. For example, the policy for ABC company would have the named insured as the ABC company, but in the definition of insured, it would include all directors, officers, and employees as well. The definition of encrypted data. It's important to confirm that the coverage is not limited to just encrypted data, but just data in general. The claim trigger, claim made versus occurrence, as in when the claim is made versus when it is occurring. Most cyber policies are written on a claims made basis. And I want you to remember this claims made concept because it's going to be important in the next couple of slides. Territory, it's important to have a worldwide extension on a cyber policy because let's face it, we're all traveling. We've got laptops, we have phones, we have other devices that have sensitive data and it's going everywhere we go. So it's important that policies are worldwide in territory and not just limited to the US. And also to have on the exclusion for act of war or terrorism. This is an exclusion that needs to be removed from the policy because it infers that coverage would not apply to the nation state attacks. So we're going to go back um, and discuss the mergers and acquisitions now. So remember a few slides back where we discussed the mergers and acquisitions and the potential limitation of coverage for the buyer and the acquirer. In a stock purchase or merger, the acquiring company is also acquiring the assets of the acquiring company, of the acquired company. Cyber policies are written on a claims made basis. So what does this mean? So any incident prior to the acquisition would not be covered by the acquired company unless they purchase com coverage for a period of time or after the acquisition. So the company that's being acquired would have to buy coverage that would extend beyond the time of their existence into the new company, okay? Sometimes it's a year, two years, three years. The claims made means that the policy responding is the one when the claim is made, not when the incident occurred. So that's why it's important for the company who's being acquired or merged into another have what we call a tail coverage because the company who's acquiring them will not be able to pick up any cyber losses that are reported after the merger and or acquisition date. Also, many insurance policies include language regarding acquisitions and mergers and when coverage is no longer in force. For example, uh, many of these policies will say that as of the acquisition date or as of the merger date, this policy is null and void. So this is important to review this in M&As and to understand the policy that's 
part of the acquisition. Meredith, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Um, that was all great. Um, I think, you know, covered quite a lot in a short period of time, um, but we'd like to really open up the discussion for questions now. Um, remember to use the question box in the webinar interface to submit your questions. And really, you know, if you have any questions, please ask them. We, we have Julie on the line, so she is the expert. So now is a good chance to get those questions answered. So uh, while we collect those questions, uh, let me give you a little bit more information about Total Insurance. So Total Insurance utilizes a multi-dimensional platform of professionals to include certified risk management, on-staff attorney, CPA, and MBA, all of which bring a unique perspective to analyzing risk for a corporation. At Total, the approach in working with clients is to start at the beginning by understanding the client's operations and identifying the risks goals and objectives of the company. It is through this approach that they have assisted many corporations in assessing their exposures to risk and identifying the appropriate risk financing and risk control tools that are effective for managing exposure while meeting the overall corporate object objectives. All right, so now let's get to some questions. Um, I'm not really seeing any roll in yet, but please submit them. Um, Julie, I know you had a couple of frequently asked questions um, to go over and, you know, if you wanna go ahead and answer okay. those. I do, Meredith. Um, one of the questions when it comes to cyber is that, that I often hear is like, how difficult is the application process? And I will tell you that it has gotten much easier over time. This is like anything. You know, when cyber first came out, you know, about five years ago when it was really starting to get some traction in the industry, you know, they had these long applications and you're like, oh my God, I've got to assemble the entire IT team in order to do this. They were like dictionaries. That's the best thing I can describe. And, you know, what a turnoff to a company. They're like, yeah, just what I want to do is spend like, you know, whatever amount of time to fill out this application. I think we all know human nature. You see that, and you're like, yeah, later. And so that's exactly what happened. People didn't want to do it. So the insurance industry realized exposure wasn't going away, but we're not getting people to understand that they need this. But how do we facilitate it, um, the distribution of this? So they've streamlined the application, but they've also gotten smarter, too, because they've learned what kind of claims are happening and what kind of questions to ask instead of just asking everything beyond what was needed. So I can't tell you the process has gotten much easier. Like, no lie, it was probably a 20 page application that's probably been consolidated down to three now. And so it's much easier to do. And, you know, with that came the price going down as well. I mean, you know, when this thing started out like five or so years ago, it was like, yeah, no one's gonna buy this. Now it's remarkably inexpensive and I think, I think it's pretty amazing. And a lot of it has to do with just, there's enough people buying, it's like the whole law of large numbers. Enough companies are buying it now that allows insurance companies to be more cost effective at it. And I have to say, even if you, you are all seeing possibly the insurance costs going up for businesses, not seeing it happening in the cyber because it's something that the industry has really got their arms around and understand. Um, another question I have is, are a lot of companies buying it? and yeah, I mean, it's really surprising because of the types of companies, you know, you always think of the tech-based companies buying the coverage, but it's a lot of companies buying it because as we see, it can happen to anybody. And, you know, I have this one client that he's really, really cost conscious about what he spends his money on as far as insurance. And for him, it was like $1,800 for the cyber coverage last year, a million dollars, beautiful policy. And he's like, are you kidding me? He says, of course I'm going to buy that. But he's a company that you would never have expected to buy, but he knows. He hears it. It's happening to everybody. It's like for the forensic team and the legal advice alone, he goes, it's worth it. And he's right. So it's really, you know, will you have a third party, you know, liability? I don't know. Some do, some don't. And I could tell you what happened with Target all those years ago. There wasn't an insurance policy that could have possibly covered that anyways because of the enormity. But the best part of it is just that it could take 
the load of the expenses on a company when you go through the whole process of the forensics and notification and the ongoing um, expense to the company. You know, even including media relations, these insurance companies help with that so that, you know, they, they uh, manage the process as far as how the media presents a company when they've been, you know, hacked and how it's being reported. Do we have any other questions out there that, that I can help with? I think that might be all for today. Um, yeah, well, if you guys do have any further questions moving forward, you know, as you review this presentation or if anything comes to mind later, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, you can reach our company, um, you can reach us directly at marketing at trade risk guarantee. Um, additionally, check out our blog at traderiskguarantee.com slash TRGPeak. Um, it's a treasure trove of excellent articles and information. And don't forget, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, YouTube. We will be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with links from the presentation. So look out for that in your inbox. Um, it will also contain the recording of this uh, webinar so that you can rewatch it if you would like. Um, yeah, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Uh, we know that topics like this can be confusing and the TRG team really just wants to provide support where we can um, and also, you know, give you guys access to some other experts in the industry. Um, thank you so much again for attending and have a nice day.